Hello, so I'm Max Barclay and I'm going to be taking over uh, from this meeting as the president, uh, incoming president of the Coleoptera Society. So I've been asked to give a talk about my involvement with beetles and my day-to-day -day work with Coleoptera. Now my job is as curator of the collection of beetles here at the Natural History Museum in London and I would like to welcome you into the collection and show you some of the highlights and some of the day-to-day -day work that we're doing here in the collection. Now the collection dates back to the 1700s. This is a box of material collected by Sir Joseph Banks, who lived from 1743 to 1820. And he was the naturalist on Captain Cook's Endeavour voyages. So he was one of the first scientists to visit places like Australia and Hawaii. And he was bringing back beetles at a time when insect collections were very rare and insects from the tropics had hardly been seen in, in Europe. So this collection is thick with Fabrician types. All of the red labels you can see are from Fabricius because he was a personal friend of Banks and he was working up material from Banks' collection. There's a picture of Banks there and some of the curation staff of the museum, past and present. Another historical collection that's quite famous is, of course, the collection of Charles Darwin, which he made on the Beagle voyages. Now, Darwin's personal collection that he made in England is at Cambridge University Museum of Zoology, but his Beagle material, which amounts to about 8,000 Coleoptera collected in the 1830s, is mostly here at the Natural History Museum. And here's a map that my colleagues Lydia and Lucia prepared of the world showing the Beagle voyages. So uh, Africa has sort of shifted slightly in that map. But uh, Darwin was collecting even very small beetles because he was an enthusiast of Coleoptera from his earliest childhood. When he was at Cambridge University, he spent most of his time, instead of studying theology, which is what he was supposed to be studying, he was uh, going off into the fields and swamps and collecting beetles. And this grabbed the attention of an academic called Henslow, who recommended him for the Beagle Voyage as a companion to the captain. And the rest, of course, is history. The other great evolutionist of the 19th century was Alfred Russell Wallace. We'll just take this drawer off. This drawer hasn't been seen in the museum for a number of years because it's been on an international tour. It's been in Australia and in Canada, in Taiwan and Singapore, and it has now returned home after eight years traveling. And it was eight years that Wallace also spent in the Malay archipelago, during which time he collected about 80,000 beetles. He was selling the specimens to pay for his expedition uh, through Stephen's auctions. And so consequently, they are not all in one place. Some of them are in various museums in Britain and elsewhere in Europe, but uh, a very large percentage of them are here at the Natural History Museum. And this is just a display drawer of Wallace's material put together to show some of the things he collected in the Malay Archipelago, which is now from New Guinea across Indonesia and into Malaysia and Singapore. You can't do a talk about a beetle collection without showing Titanus giganteus. Titanus giganteus is just a nice insect to display. And um, there's a Czech book that was written about 20 years ago by Yaroslav Marek, which says that the Natural History Museum collection includes the largest specimen of Titanus giganteus in the world, and that it's more than 20 centimeters long. This is not true, and all of my life as a curator, I've been trying to find out the basis of this story and eventually concluded that somebody has measured this female specimen from the tip of the mandibles to the tip of the extended ovipositor and therefore come up with an excessively large number. Because people who are interested in Titanus are often interested in exactly how big they are. Now, this specimen at the end was collected by Michael Barker in French Guiana about 20 years ago and it was brought back alive. And it lived its natural life in captivity, and we displayed it on daytime television, which was quite entertaining because the other guest, apart from the beetle, and I was there as a beetle handler, the other guest was a politician who was quite disturbed by the presence of a large beetle that was threatening to fly just a few inches from where she was sitting. I put out the rootline chafers, there's a drawer of Chrysina here, and a drawer here of Spodoclamini. 
I've just completed recently together with uh, student Will Bayfield Farrell and my colleague uh, Keita Matsumoto. We've completed a paper on the Spodoclamini in the Natural History Museum collection, which is a historical and taxonomic review. And we're now completing a similar review on Chrysina. So Chrysina is going to be the next subject of the paper in the Coleopterus Bulletin, hopefully. What are we doing when we're not giving public talks and we're not writing papers? Well, one of the things that we're doing is trying to build the collection. The collection is not a static affair of historical material. Even though the Banks and the Darwin and the Wallace material is very famous, there are also many, many drawers of recently collected material. And this is material that um, uh, Keita has mounted from recently collected Africa material in collaboration with the African Natural History Research Trust. And this comes back from the field in jars of alcohol and then gets mounted on card points or on card uh, mounts, depending on who's doing it. Uh, one of these boxes was mounted in the Czech Republic by professional mounters. The other is mounted here by my colleagues. And the next stage will be to put QR codes on all of these and to identify them, describe any new species, send them out on research loan if necessary, if we don't have the expertise in-house, which of course with 400,000 species of beetle, you don't have the expertise in-house for most things. So we have about 100,000 specimens out on research loan at any one time. And many of you in the audience will have received loans from the museum and will be familiar with the process. So we go to the big beetle meetings this is a bag that I brought back recently from the insect meeting in Prague, and that includes several loan boxes. This is a loan that was sent out in 2021 to Roman Borovets, who is an expert on Kukulionids in the Czech Republic. And so that was sent out as undetermined material. And as you can see, it's come back full of red labels. And so Roman has found and described many new species from our African material. So two years ago, that just looked like the material in those drawers over there, having just been mounted. And now it's been laid out, labeled, identified, and in some cases described as new species. There's a whole bag of material from Prague there. Another bag here that I recently brought back from um, the Entomological Society of America in, in, in Vancouver. And there's, for example, a box here that was returned thanks to Sarah Smith, Anthony Cognato, and uh, Lech Karpinski, of material that was borrowed in the 1980s by Zablotny at um, Michigan. And uh, this material has been returned in perfect condition and can go back into the collection. So that's an example of a loan that was out for a very long period of time. But thanks to people's hard work and good offices, it's been returned safely. So we spend a lot of our time, we supposedly spend about 25% of our time on processing incoming and outgoing loan material. And those two bags are all that we have in the way of recently acquired loan material because we try to get it back into the collection as soon as possible. The other big activity, of course, of a curator of a major museum is dealing with acquisitions. The most recent acquisition that we made, that we only just got in last week, and I brought this up from the freezer, the quarantine freezer this morning, this is one of 26 boxes from the E.J. Bunnett collection, which was the collection of the Juniper Hall Field Station in Surrey. And Juniper Hall is a beautiful place in Box Hill, uh, which is Chalk Downland in the south of England. And it's famous to entomologists from Britain because it's the last place in the country where the giant horned dung beetle, well, giant by British standards, maybe not by your standards, but the, big, the biggest dung beetle that we have, Copris lunaris, was last recorded at Juniper Hill, Box Hill, in 1955. And according to the literature, this is the review of the scarce and threatened coleoptera, there have been no records since then. So when I heard that Juniper Hall was giving up their collection, I thought, well, that's interesting because probably that 1955 specimen of Copris might be amongst them. So we get down and look at the labels on these copras. And this one actually has Box Hill, July 70. Now that's enticing because of course, if 1955 is the most recent record, 1970 would be 15 years later and it would bring forward the date of the last known British capture of that species by 15 years. 
We do have to rule out the possibility that it's 1870, but considering that the collector was born in 1875, that's extremely unlikely. It's also unlikely that he collected it in 1970, but it's possible that the field station continued to develop the collection after the death of the original collector, and that that specimen is from 1970. But we'll have to go back and trace the handwriting and find out exactly who and when collected that. And for that kind of historical research, something like this recently published book by my colleague, British Coleopterists by Michael Darby, is extremely useful resource for finding out the dates of birth and death and the areas of the country inhabited by different coleopterists. Now what we have behind us, we have an example of some of the recent acquisitions that have come in to the collection. This is not beetles. That's a box of butterflies from a private school in Surrey which interestingly contains a ganandromorphic specimen of Goniopteryx cleopatra, the Mediterranean brimstone. And so there was a time when exclusive private schools used to have quite large collections of insects. And that's an example of one of them. Another collection from a, a late colleague, Dr. John Parry, who was a private collector and a pharmacologist by tradition, by trade. Uh, this was his box of the genus Bagoas on the lower half and Apion on the top half. Bagoas are very rarely collected. They're difficult to collect. They're aquatic weevils that live on water plants. So finding that number of Bagoas in a lifetime is really quite extraordinary and no doubt represents some records that will be of great interest to conservationists. Because Bagoas is not a common genus. Another acquisition is from the superbly talented artist, Mark Russell, who was doing illustrations of apionid weevils. And this is his collection, which he was using as a basis for his artwork of beautifully curated and beautifully labeled apionid weevils, showing the diversity of this group, which to the naked eye, they all look the same, but when you look at them down a microscope or in one of Mark's extraordinary and large drawings, they actually are formidably diverse. We've got another collection here that has come in from my colleague Adam Sharp, who is now the biodiversity officer in Ascension Island in the middle of the Atlantic. And this is a series of malaise trap samples from Ascension Island. And uh, they required to be sorted and the beetles identified as species. And the interesting thing about Ascension is that it differs from the other mid-Atlantic island of St. Helena because a great number of the invasive species in Ascension come from North America, whereas the invasive species in St. Helena come from Europe and Africa. So we're finding uh, interesting North American brookines and cerambicids and things like that in these samples that are not known from uh, St. Helena. But the biggest acquisition, probably of the century, certainly of the year, which came in in November 2022, is this. This is the collection of Dr. Elphinstone Forrest Gilmore, who was a entomologist. Uh, he was born in 1922, and he was the director of the Doncaster Museum and Galleries. And when he left the country, after leaving the museum, he left his collection behind at Doncaster. And the museum here has been hoping to acquire this important collection for, for many years. Finally, Doncaster decided that they wanted to deposit the collection here in London. And Gilmore's collection contains, uh, it's estimated about 39,000 cerambicids. But I, I think that's probably an overestimate. I think the number is probably closer to about 25,000 looking at it. There's about 180 boxes like this, and it contains about 300 type species, and so species represented by type specimens as well. So one of our next jobs is to process that acquisition. What we do with acquisitions like this is that we'll attach a label to every single specimen, giving its provenance and saying this was presented by Doncaster Museum and is the collection of Elphinstone Forest Gilmore or such like. So all of the information is always associated with the specimen, even though it will move out of this substandard housing and into more modern housing. 
I'll just show you behind me. This is not relevant to what I'm talking about at the moment, but I'm just going to show you this because it's really cool. This has been on the Treasures Touring Exhibition for the last seven or eight years, and so we haven't seen it for a long time. But this is a gold ring containing a weevil from Hispaniola in the West Indies called Tetrabathinus regalis. And we have a picture of the ring that we've often used in public talks, but we've actually got the real thing there. And very, very little is known about the provenance of this ring, except for the, the fact that the weevil is clearly from uh, Hispaniola. So I'll just show you down the length of the collection before we close. If you cast your eye down that corridor, that is what 27,000 drawers of beetles looks like. This gallery is the whole west face of the museum, which is filled with the beetle collection. And you can see in the foreground, uh, Dr. Georgi Makranzi, who is from Budapest, who is the world expert on oxytiline staphylinids. And he's working through the legacy of our late colleague, Peter Hammond, who was head of uh, Coleoptera here for many years and who was also a specialist on oxytiline, and who left, as many of us do, and many of us will, a lot of unpublished types and unfinished projects, and Yogi is working through the massive collection of oxytiline. And behind me now, we've got a draw scanning system. We're trying to digitize the whole collection, and the first stage in digitizing the collection is by scanning each individual draw. So the digitizers are taking the glass off the draw, making a high-resolution scan of the contents. The name labels are horizontal so that the species can be associated with their names. And then these are going to be made available online. We've already done the whole Carabidi collection, which is about 2,000 drawers, and we're starting with the rest of the Coleoptera. And we're hoping that by the end of 2023, we'll have the whole collection online. So I hope very much that we'll see many of you here in the collection in London, and you'll be extremely welcome. But even if you can't come to London in this time, we're hoping that the collection will be able to come to you by being available online in the next few years. And I'm very pleased and very proud to be taking over the presidency of the Coleopterous Society as of today. So thank you very much for attending and I hope to see many of you here in London in the next few years. Thank you.